Welcome back one and all to another weekly space news update with me. We've got a lot of ground to cover with Starship updates this week, as well as some news regarding SLS, ULA, Arca Space and more. So let's get right to it. We'll begin, as always, with all the latest news and updates regarding SpaceX's Starship development. <laughs> Works down at Starbase continue at record pace. While we're no longer seeing the rapid turnaround of ship rollouts, static fires, flights and explosions, that's not to say that SpaceX aren't still hard at work on the Starship program. As we've been covering over the past few weeks now, most of SpaceX's efforts are currently being focused on Stage Zero, which is the name given for all the infrastructure that'll support a Starship orbital launch. That's the fuel storage, launch tower, launch pad, and of course the massive Mechazilla arms that'll catch the rocket upon its return. This stuff is extremely important to get right, but also represents an enormous challenge for SpaceX. Elon Musk himself considers Stage Zero's design and construction to be potentially even more complex than building the Starship and Super Heavy themselves, something he stated during Everyday Astronauts' interview. The, the launch system, the tower, and the, you know, the chopstick arms to catch the rocket are as complex as either of the stages. But unfazed by the challenges ahead, SpaceX are pressing on. This week, we saw big steps toward getting the tower ready for supporting orbital flights. On Monday, the quick disconnect arm extension was moved to the launch site, and then on Thursday, it was lifted into place. The claw design of the arm allows it to hold the Super Heavy booster during fueling, which will provide a good connection with the ship while also helping to keep the vehicle stable when out on the pad. Of course, the main piece that'll keep the rocket steady are the Mechazilla arms, which, as mentioned earlier, is the gigantic mechanism that'll catch the rocket's first and second stages during the landing. These are well on the way to being mounted to the tower as well. In fact, I'd wager they'll be installed incredibly soon, because on Saturday, Booster 4 was removed from the launch pad and placed onto the booster stand. This was presumably done so that there's no big expensive rocket to accidentally hit during the lift of the arms onto the tower itself. So this week we'll hopefully almost certainly see the addition of the arms. SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric does a great job interpreting all the photos we get of Starbase into accurate 3D models of how things will eventually look and I must say that his latest render gets me very excited about seeing all of this in real life. The recent FAA report on Starbase activities featured a diagram of the proposed Stage Zero with Starship and we can see from here how the arms will move up and down the tower via a carriage and pulley system. Unfortunately, while we won't have to wait too long to see it all built, Mechazilla won't be put to use as a catching system anytime soon. It certainly won't be catching Booster 4 or Ship 20. We've known for a while now that both of these vehicles will be soft landing into the ocean. And while Elon has expressed desire for Booster 5 to be the first booster to be caught, I am a little bit skeptical that SpaceX will get the approval from the FAA or indeed have enough faith in their rocket itself. Booster 5 will only be SpaceX's second operational Super Heavy, and if things go wrong, then they have the potential to go very, very wrong. SpaceX cannot afford to lose Stage Zero, so I really wouldn't be surprised if future boosters and ships also splash down into the ocean while development is ongoing. Time will tell, I suppose, but for now, it'll remain unknown. And if you, dear viewer, would also like to remain unknown while using the internet, then why not consider NordVPN, who have kindly sponsored today's episode of Space This Week. NordVPN currently helps keep millions of users around the world stay safe and anonymous, with more than 5,200 servers across 60 different countries. That means that no matter where you are, you'll be able to connect to a server near you to enjoy better speeds, or further away to gain access to region-locked content. And you can use NordVPN on pretty much any of the major platforms, from Windows to iOS to Android TV to Linux, which is great because one NordVPN subscription can protect up to six devices at once, all with the ease of a simple one click of a button, or just use automatic connection for click-free protection. If all of this sounds good to you, then visit nordvpn.com slash loun, or just use code loun to get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. So, what are you waiting for? Click that link in the description or in the pinned comment and go get yourself some sweet internet anonymity. 
Anyway, while we're still on the subject of stage zero, SpaceX are inching ever closer to completing the orbital tank farm. These vertical tanks contain all the fuel necessary to support an orbital launch, as well as ample water supply for the deluge systems. We saw ambient testing at the farm on Sunday and Tuesday last week, and on Friday, GSE Tank 1 was entombed in its cryo shell. These white cylinders encase the tanks to keep their contents insulated from the blistering Texas heat, given that the liquids have to be kept at extremely cold temperatures. The only tank yet to be added to the site is GSE Tank 8, which is basically ready to be rolled out to the farm any day now. As you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest excellent infographic, GSE Tank is ready! <laughs> There's a road closure scheduled for Monday the 27th, so there is a chance that it'll be rolled out either today or very soon afterward if not. In addition to the vertical tanks we've been following, last week we also saw two mysterious tanks rolled to the launch site. They're most likely additional GSE tanks which will store gaseous nitrogen, oxygen, methane, helium and or hydraulic fluid. This speculation is based on the environmental impact statement published by the FAA in May 2020, which describes SpaceX's desire to have additional commodity tanks to bolster the vertical tank farm. These horizontal tanks would be smaller in capacity than the main farm's vertical tanks, as shown in this table here. It'll be interesting to see how these tanks end up being used and how many SpaceX will eventually have for the orbital launch area. Returning now to Brendan Lewis's Starbase Progress Diagram, you may notice that a few other ships beyond Booster 4 and Ship 20 are in the works at Starbase. Ship 21 and Ship 22 are springing up very quickly, as is Booster 5, which is quickly filling up the high bay. I am wondering if Ship 22 will get the new one-piece nose cone that we saw in Everyday Astronaut's Starbase tour with Elon. SpaceX have recently been refining the manufacturing process of the nose cones to make them much smoother by eliminating the need for the stacked segments to make them. Comparing this design with SN8s really goes to show how quickly SpaceX are evolving the Starship's design. We already know that the vehicle's forward flaps will change a lot in upcoming versions of Starship, most notably by making them smaller and moving them upward and inwards towards the leeward side of the vehicle, as seen here in a great render by Eric. So really, in summary, all is business as usual down at Starbase. We may see testing of Ship 20 and Booster 4 this week. After all, Elon did express desire to start static fire testing a few weeks ago now, but I think that that'll be difficult with all the lifting and placing of various things that'll be happening over the course of this week. So I would say we're probably looking at next week at the very earliest for a static fire, but of course I would love for SpaceX to prove me wrong here. Anyway, we didn't just get amazing progress updates on Starship last week, we also had some great new shots and updates for NASA's space launch system. But to talk about that, and of course everything else that happened last week, I'll need to roll that transition card to the next segment of the video. Before we get to SLS, I want to quickly touch on the one orbital launch we saw last week. This was a long March 7th, which carried the Tianzhu-3, the second unmanned cargo spacecraft to be sent to the Tiangong space station. Tiangong, which has currently spent just over four months in orbit, doesn't have any inhabitants on board at present, but three Taikonauts will hopefully be heading there for a six-month mission as early as the 16th of October. So I'm looking forward to being able to talk to you all about this mission when the date rolls around. So yes, SLS, we got some new images of the rocket nearly fully completed in the vehicle assembly building. I especially love this photo here, which not only gives us a great sense of scale of this beast, but also gives us an idea of how it will look on the launch pad, with the only real difference being that the mass simulator sitting at the top of the stack will be replaced by the Orion vehicle. These big grey structures at the bottom are where the liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel lines connect, which we got some great video footage of this week. NASA have been testing the umbilical release system for the fueling arms, which of course need to be yanked away from the rocket at liftoff. The footage here really gets me excited to seeing this mammoth, ever delayed rocket finally soar to the skies, and it also gives us a good idea of how SpaceX's quick disconnect arm will look, being pulled away from the Super Heavy at launch as well. Now, there weren't a lot of other things that I really wanted to discuss from last week, but there are a lot of things happening this week to look forward to, so let's take a look at that now. Today, on the 27th of September, we'll see China launch a Kwaizu 1A from the Jiuquan launch site. This rocket will be carrying a Gaofen Earth Observation Satellite into low Earth orbit on behalf of Changguang Satellite Technology, which is a Chinese research institution. As well as that, we'll also see an Atlas V launch today from the Vandenberg launch site. On board will be three Landsat 9 meteorology satellites, which will be placed into low Earth orbit. 
It's been a while since we saw an Atlas launch, so I'm looking forward to watching ULA succeed with this one, especially after the recent disappointments from the scrapped Starliner launch earlier this year. We have another launch today. Monday is where it's at for the week, it seems. Monday marks the opening of the launch window for the maiden flight of Eco Rocket. This brand new vehicle will be launching from the Black Sea launch site on behalf of Arca Space and is the first launch attempt of a Romanian launch vehicle. The payload is still yet to be confirmed. It'll probably just be a mass simulator, to be honest. But I, for one, am really hoping this launch goes off successfully. They have until the 12th of October to send it, so best of luck to Arca Space. And that's it. That's everything that's happening this week, which means that's the end of the video. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to leave a little like down below, that really helps me out in surviving the YouTube algorithm TM. And if you want to support me any further, maybe like the guys scrolling on the left here, you can click on the link on screen or in the description to join my Patreon, or you can also join the channel by clicking the join button below the video. You guys know how all of this goes, right? And you know, make sure you're subscribed. If you're not, that would be that would be pretty cash money of you. Is that something the kids still say? I'm so out of touch. There are there's two videos on screen as well. They're from my channel. This was great. This is a really great outro. Thank you for watching, everyone. And thank, that's 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 my video.